Romans chapter 10. We're going to be in the first five verses. Romans 10. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer for God, uh, to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law, for righteousness to everyone that believeth. For Moses describeth the righteousness, pardon me, which is of the law, that a man which doeth those things shall live by them. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this blessed book. pray that you help us to understand what um, is being taught here about some zeal and, uh, and some importance about zeal. And some things that uh, we really need to, to kind of be mindful of when we're, when we're working for the Lord. I thank you for this blessed book. I pray that you take me out of it completely and help us to really understand what you're trying to get through to us. And uh, put your words in my mouth, Lord. And I pray that you help us to really all be zealous for the Lord, but do it in a way that is not ignorant of your devices and your ways, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So Paul here is, is talking about Israel in our text. He's talking about the context is Israel and how Israel really did have a zeal and a desire for God. And they desire to serve something. Zeal, is, uh, zeal according to Webster's 1828, is defined uh, as, as a passionate ardor in the pursuit of something. It means, it means you, you, you chase after something with a fervency. It's something that you do with some umption and gumption, right? It's something that you do with uh, some, some passion and some fire. You feel about it. It's, you feel some deeply about it. And believe it or not, Israel did have a zeal for the Lord. I mean, we can... There was always those people who were zealous for the Lord. There was always those people who, who did right in the sight of God or tried to do right, who tried to serve Him. And they, they were passionate about something. They were on fire for something. They were a faith-filled people. Now, that sounds kind of silly when I talk, when I say it up here, but if you think about it, it's true. I mean, well, you know, the Jews require a sign. They're not full of faith. They're not full of faith. Well, I mean, they, they still had faith. They just needed that little kick in the pants sometimes to point them in the right direction. And we all need that. We all need that sometimes. Now, I'm not saying we need signs and wonders to show us that what we believe is true. Uh, the, the Jews needed those types of things, but they were zealous about the Lord. But when you look at their history, they had zeal that was often misguided. And that is, is still a problem today. That is still something that goes on to this very day. They were always in pursuit of something. Um, it, but it wasn't always aimed in the right direction. In verse 3 here in our text, in, he, in, in uh, Romans chapter 10, verse 3, it says, they being ignorant of God's righteousness. So they, they, they pursued after him, not even understanding what exactly it was they were understanding. They pursued after God, not really understanding what God wanted from them in order to pursue. And oftentimes that got them in places and predicaments that were not very comfortable for them. Oftentimes, it, ha it landed them in captivity. <laughs> Oftentimes, Paul did this too. Paul, did this. Paul absolutely did this because he was zealous for his people. He had a fire for his people, the Jews, and he went to them when God says, hold on, you know, you're, I'm going to give you the opportunity to go to them, but here, I want you here, and I want you to do this. And, and then he, he kept trying to go back to Israel. He kept trying to go back to Israel. And, it, and what, where, where did he end up? He ended up in a jailhouse or he ended up on a ship that was wrecked. It, it caused him some problems because his zeal, while he did was trying to do something good, something right, it was often misguided because of this, this fervent desire for his people. And Paul's greatest Christian ever lived. I'm not talking, trying not to talk bad about him, but I'm just, it happened. If it can happen to Paul, it can happen to any one of us, right? Paul was, was trying to do right. And, he, and one thing that you'll notice about all of Paul's writings is a lot of times when he walked into a, into a city, where did he go first? He went to the synagogue. He was going to his people. He was doing what God wanted him to do. He was out 
to the Gentiles, but where did he go? He, he went to where he knew Jews were going to be, right? And he, and, he, and he spoke to the Jews. So he did have opportunities to speak to his people, but he still wanted to go to Israel, to, to his home, to his home, and talk to those people. And, uh, and, and let me tell you something. Zeal is a great thing. It's a wonderful thing. It is ne- it's desperately needed within the church. There are far too many churches who are, who are just dead because they, they just don't they have people that don't want to do anything for the Lord. But you cannot have only zeal. You have to have zeal that is tempered with something. I think, I think it was Bob Jones Sr. I don't quote me on who it exactly said it, but I think it was Bob Jones Sr. said, a good Christian, this is a quote, a good Christian is someone who is in fellowship with Jesus Christ and is obedient to his word. Right? Our text here says that they establish their own righteousness. And we all know how good our own righteousness really is. So zeal is a wonderful thing. Zeal is a great thing. Zeal is important. But the Christian walk, the Christian life is so much more than the zeal that you have for the Lord. It's so much more than just the work. Look, there are plenty of There are plenty of people out there. There are plenty of other religions out there who are zealous for God. The JWs, Jehovah's Witnesses, they are zealous for the Lord, are they not? They're serving the wrong God, but but they're zealous for Him. The Mormons. Man, the JWs, every time you meet a JW, what what ends up happening? You end up with something in your hands, don't you? They're zealous in handing out literature. They're zealous about telling you about their God. The Mormons, man, they are zealous about personal work, are they not? Man, they are two by two, out two by two, out two by two, out two by two, knocking on doors, knocking on doors, knocking on doors, knocking on doors, knocking on doors. Why? They're zealous about something. The Catholics. The Catholics were so zealous about some things that they burned Christians at the stake. That's how zealous they were. Bible-believing Christians, Christians who believed what God had said, they were so zealous, they got to the point where they had only zeal and they were ignorant of the things that God said, that they decided that it would be better for that person who withstood them to burn than it would be to let them speak. That's how zealous they were. Zeal is a wonderful thing, but it has to be tempered. It has to be tempered with the knowledge of what God wants. So that is kind of the the overall theme of today. So when we look at some of these things, we can really kind of see <clears throat> we can really kind of see what God wants us to do. Like I said, the JWs are I'll hand you out literature. The Mormons were always personal work you. The Catholic Church will kill you. And I, and and you know what the you know what the Baptists do? They're, they're zealous about their potlucks. That's what the Baptists are zealous about. <laughs> after I just announced we're having two of them within the next month. Bible believers are really no different. We just aim our zeal in a different direction. We aim our zeal at ourself. And, and I, man, I hate to say these things. I hate, I hate to say some of this stuff because I'm guilty of some of this stuff myself. I know many a, many a student, many a, a young Christian who just came out of Bible college and thinks they're going to set the world on fire. <laughs> we all, we, man, I tell you what, when you go to that three-year Bible college in Pensacola, you come out of that school with more Bible knowledge. I mean, you know Scripture. You memorize Scripture. If you go through that school and memorize half, if you only remember half of what you're taught, you have a better Bible education, doctrinally speaking, a Bible education than any, any seminary you're ever going to go to, secular seminary in this world. I promise you. Bob Jones, Bob Jones University can't hold a candle. Grace College can't hold a candle. Liberty can't hold a candle. And I'm telling you, they teach, they teach Bible, and I, I'm going to put the Bible in, parent, in quotes there because that's what they'll tell you they teach, but they teach, quote, unquote, the Bible. But I tell you what, at that school that I went to, you learned the Bible. And, there, and that creates this, this false sense of, I know the Bible so well that I'm going to go and set the world on fire. I'm going to be the next Billy Sunday. 
I'm going to be the next Billy Graham. And then when they walk out of that school with that zeal and that Bible tucked up, and they go out there and they're going to take the world on, and what happens? What happens to them three years later? Where are they? They're flat on their face. Why? Because they, they took something that they had, and, they, and in their zeal they decided they were going to go do something for the Lord, and they didn't bother to find out what the Lord wanted to do before they went and did it. That's the zeal without the wisdom. It has to be tempered. It has to be, has to be cut with something so that it can be useful. Bible believers do that. Man, what, what the problem is is they're focused on what they're going to do for the Lord and they're not focused on the relationship with the Lord. It's always, what can I do for you, Lord? <clears throat> and this may be a controversial statement, especially in some crowns, but, um, well, here we go. If your relationship... Your relationship with Jesus Christ is more important than soul winning. I know that might strike you. You got to think about that for a second. Maybe your eyebrows kind of raised. Maybe you're kind of twirling that around up here for a second. I don't know. But let me tell you something. The honest to God's truth is your relationship with the Lord is more important than soul winning. Why? Think about this for a minute. It's important, it's more important than handing out tracts. It's more important than telling somebody else about Jesus Christ. And the reason I say that is, is that your relationship with Jesus Christ, your relationship with God, if it is not where it needs to be, then that, that witness doesn't do any good. That track might do some good because the Holy Spirit does some work, Right? But that witness won't be any good because you are not where you need to be with the Lord. He is not blessing your ministry. He is not blessing you in your work. Now, now you might say, well, that's kind of weak, Pastor. I don't really, I, I still think you need to go witness. I still think, I absolutely, I'm not telling you not to go talk to people. I am absolutely not telling you it's okay to not witness to people. I am absolutely not telling you that it's okay to not talk to people, to not do personal work, to not do what you're supposed to do. What I'm telling you to do is to get your relationship right with the Lord before you do those things. Because, you, you, you know, we go out there and we try to hand out tracts and we try to talk to people and, and, you know, what do we always say? Well, there, there's no results. The devil's really working here. Well, is it really the devil really working here or is it that you need to get some things right before you go out and do those things? Now, I'm, I'm, that's just, I don't know your guys' lives. I try not to dig into your guys' lives. I'm not really picking on anybody here. But what I'm telling you is that if you want the Lord to bless your ministry, you better live the ministry before you ask him to go and bless it. Your fellowship with Jesus Christ is the absolute most important thing for a Christian after salvation. Absolute most important thing. Once the relationship is there, then you go and do those things for the Lord. There is so much that we can do for the Lord, but we'll never know if that's what the Lord wants us to do until our relationship is there. There are, now, now there, are, there are some things that are absolutely universal, absolutely universal that the God always wants us to do. Right? He, he wants all of us to do these things. Right? I, I spoke just a little bit in the announcements that all of us are called to preach, but we're not all called to be pastors. Right? All of us are called to preach. It's God's will for you and every one of you to preach the gospel. It's God's will for each and every one of you to be thankful. It's God's will for each and every one of you to be sanctified. It's God's will for each and every one of you. Do you see where I'm going with this? It, there, are, there are some things that are universal. But here's the thing, how do you know that what you are supposed to be doing for the Lord is actually what the Lord wants you to do until you ask Him, and you cannot ask Him and get an answer with any kind of clarity until your relationship with the Lord has been built. All of those things are important. It's important for every one of us to preach. It's important for every one of us to witness. It's important for every one of us to do those things. 
that's universal. The when, the where, the how, and the why are very personal. And until you get those things down, you can't expect results in any kind of personal ministry. And God doesn't care about the results anyway. He doesn't care about the results of your ministry. He absolutely does not care about how big your church gets or how many people you bring to church. You know what he cares about? He cares that you brought people to church. He cares that you thought to bring people to church. He cares that you put yourself out there to do it. He does not judge you on the standards of other people. He doesn't judge you on whether or not they stay in this church. You know what he judges you by? You went and you gave that person a track and you talked to him and said, hey, let me tell you about, let me tell you about this guy named Jesus. And then, hey, let me tell you, bring you to this church. He's more interested in that than he is you actually getting their butts in this seat because you know what? Getting their butts in this seat is not on you. It's on them. But the only thing that you can do is show them. And until you get your relationship right, that's just not going to happen. You might get some stragglers. You might get some people here and there, but... This is why it is so important for us to not look at other people and judge our standard of quote-unquote holiness or living right compared to other Christians. Now, bear with me. Each and every one of you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, right? How come I didn't hear an amen? Amen, right. Each and every one of you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, right? Amen. Amen. There we go. That's better. So... Each and every one of you have this relationship with Jesus Christ. But let's just say, let's just say I've only been saved for a year. Brother Terry, let's say you've been saved for 20 years. Is my relationship the same as yours? You're in a different place in your walk with Christ than I am in mine. Should be. Should be. Absolutely. That, amen. So you absolutely should be in a different place after being saved for 20 years than you should be than when you're saved for just a year. That's why I cannot look at another brother and say, you know what, I, 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 that's my standard for holiness. Why? Because he's in a different walk. He's in a different place than where I'm at. The Lord doesn't expect me to walk like that brother. You know what the Lord expects me to walk like? He expects me to contact him. Imagine that. We can actually speak with God and say, Lord, all right, fine, I give up this, I give up that, I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, I'm trying to live right for you, Lord, just point me in a direction and I'll go. That's what he's waiting for. He's not waiting for, for you to, to, to live a certain way like a certain brother before he pulls that trigger. He's waiting for you to contact him and say, I'm ready, Lord, show me the way. And until you have a relationship, until you can actually speak with the Lord on a one-on-one basis, that's just that just... It just doesn't work. It doesn't happen that way. Why would, God, why would God send somebody out into a mission field if he doesn't know who he is? That's another thing that I see in this, this I'm going to gung-ho, come right out, of the, right out of the seminary or PBI or wherever you go to school and you, you have this zeal for the Lord. You have some knowledge and you have this zeal and you got this kid who's 19 years old. He's newly married because he met his girl at Bible school. And, and then what does he do? 19 years old, he's like, I'm going to the mission field. I have a problem with that. Because that 19-year-old going off to the mission field hasn't experienced anything in his life that is going to be able to help those people over there in that foreign country other than Jesus Christ. They know the gospel. He doesn't even know his wife yet. And he's going to take her to a foreign country. And some of these countries, oh, let me tell you something. Some of these countries, you don't live good. You don't live well. You expect your wife to do nothing but sit around and, and watch you and follow you after, after you, quote unquote, serve the Lord in this foreign mission field. And you don't, your wife doesn't even know you yet. And you, you expect your wife to be happy on nothing but dirt floors and air. What's she going to do? That, that marriage is going to fall apart. See, the Lord puts you through things. We talked about this the last couple of weeks. The Lord puts you through things so he can help you through things so that you can help others through things. And, and that zeal, that fire that we have when we're young and we're just newly saved and we're on fire for the Lord, let me tell you something. You need a good 
old Christian to just grab you and kind of rein you in a little bit. Say, hold on a second, buddy. Are you sure that's really what the Lord wants? Now, I'm not telling you to listen to that old saint when he tells you to not do something for the Lord. I'm telling you, take that wisdom. Hold on, brother. Let's really find out if this is what the Lord really wants for you. And you need to check that. You need to check your zeal. You need to make sure if it's tempered with the right kind of wisdom and if it's really what the Lord wants us to do. Now, I'm not saying that a 19-year-old kid can't go to the mission field. Remember what the Bible says, let no man despise thy youth. Just because you're young doesn't mean you can't serve the Lord. I implore you to do such things. I'm telling you to make sure you get it right with God before you go and do anything. That's the relationship. That's the relationship. Zeal is a wonderful thing. In Titus chapter 2, it tells us to be zealous of good works. Be zealous of good works. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 19, it tells us that we should be zealous, therefore, and repent. But zeal can be misguided. Just as many times as there was zeal or zealous used in the Bible in a good context, I can show you another one that it's, that it's not used in a good context. Psalm 69, verse 9, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Psalm 119, 39, my zeal hath consumed me. And let me tell you something, your zeal, your zeal without guidance is of the devil. Your zeal without guidance is of the devil. Now let me explain a little bit. It needs, to be, it needs to be pointed in the right direction, your zeal does. It needs to be harnessed, for lack of a better term needs to be harnessed so that it can be released at the appropriate time and place. It has to be tempered. If all you have is zeal, then you're dangerous. If that's all you have is zeal, then you're dangerous. See, the devil knows this. <laughs> the devil knows these things about us. He's got 6,000 years of human experience. Just human experience. He knows how to work us. He knows that zeal that we have. You know what he has? You know what he does? I'll tell you what he does to us Bible believers. He does not confront us Bible believers head on, holding an NIV, saying, Yea, hath God said. You know why? Because us Bible believers will say, That's not even a Bible. And that's where it belongs. Right? He doesn't do that to us. The Bible believers, the ones who have that thirst and zeal for the Word, right? He doesn't approach us by attacking the Word. You know what he does? He gets behind us. And then he says, oh, here we go. You're going to go, go do something for the Lord. Wait a minute. Here's an opportunity right there. Point you that direction. And then he just goes, boop. And you know what else we do? We take off in that direction without ever finding out if that's where we're supposed to be or where we're supposed to go or ask God if that's the direction we should be going. And we do all of the work for the devil ourselves. And he doesn't have to turn as much. If we're focused on the Lord, all he's got to do is just give us a little bump on the shoulder and we just, just a little bit, and we miss the mark at the end. And all the while, we think we're doing something for the Lord. In our zeal, or our thirst to do something for him, we find ourselves out of the will of God. That's why zeal is so dangerous. And that's why he calls them ignorant here, because they're using that zeal without any kind of knowledge, without any kind of wisdom. He gets behind the Bible believer, and he just points him in a direction that is not in the will of God, and then he just gives him a little tap, and then in our thirst and our, and our desire to serve, what do we do? We trudge headlong into the jungle without, without a machete. And then what happens? <clears throat> when we miss the mark, what happens a couple years into our ministry? And you know what? When we, when we decide, hold on a second, you know, maybe this isn't the direction that I needed to go, and maybe I start taking a, look, taking a look back. You know what the devil does? He gets right behind us again, and then he pushes us. And then he pushes us, and he pushes us, and he pushes us. And you know what he does? He wears out the saints by doing that. He puts stuff in front of him, and he puts stuff in front of him, and he just keeps on trugging and keep pushing him and keep pushing him, keep pushing him. And sooner or later, you're so worn out that you pull yourself out of the ministry. And sooner or later, you pull yourself out of the will of God because I'm just so tired. I just can't take it anymore. That's what he does. He wears us out. The Bible tells us that the devil wears out the saints. 
And that's how he does it. He takes our zeal, he takes our gumption, our, our, our desire to do something for the Lord, he points it in a worldly way, and then he kicks us in the pants, and then he pushes us along the way, and we wear ourselves out, fighting the will of God the whole time, and then what do we end up doing? We end up dropping out of the race all together. All together. We, we sideline ourselves, and the devil didn't have to do anything except for point us in a direction and kick us in the pants once. You know, what, you, know, we, you know what he does? He gets us so busy. He gets us so busy that we turn, we turn into them swine in Mark chapter 5. What do we do? We, we go crazy, thinking we're doing something, thinking we're doing something, and sooner or later we end up just jumping off the cliff into the sea. And we take ourselves out of the ministry. I've seen it happen to Christians. I've seen it happen to pastors. And to be honest with you, I felt it happen in my own life. Let me tell you, I'm going to tell you something, and I don't think I've ever said this to, to really anybody other than my, my wife before. If it were not for the Jubilee last year that I went to, you might have found a different preacher standing in the pulpit today. And the reason for that is, is because I was so busy trying to do something and do something and do something and try, just try to make things fit and make things work that... I didn't really step back and see whether or not if that's the direction God wanted me to go. And what was that? That was not a change of mind. That was a change of here. I had to get some things right between me and God in that relationship before I ever took another step forward. That's why it is so much more vital that your relationship is, 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 is on point with the Lord before you go and do those things. Because what do you end up doing? You end up fighting the will of God, and before, not, before long you find yourselves out of the ministry. Were it not for a refreshing of the Spirit, and were it not for a real hard check of myself and my relationship and my walk, there's a real good chance I'd have run myself right out of the ministry. That's sobering. I, I tell you what, there's nothing more that I love than, than to, to stand here and to tell you what the Lord has given me to give you. That is... It's, it's, it's not just enjoyable for me. It's my honor and my pleasure to do so. But in my zeal to get up here and say something for the Lord, oftentimes, and it's not just me, it's pastors all across this country, oftentimes we put our own thirst for wanting to serve ahead of what the Lord actually wants. <clears throat> I heard the old preacher say one time, the doing is not the pleasing. This is a quote. The doing is not the pleasing. The pleasing must come before the doing, or our doing will not be pleasing. When he said that to me, man, oh, it like it hit me across the face like a ton of bricks. Let me say it again. The doing is not the pleasing. The pleasing must come before the doing, or the doing will not be pleasing. Just the doing itself is not pleasing. We love to preach, you know, uh, don't just be hearers of the word, should be doers. And we get so focused on the do, 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 do aspect of that that we completely ignore the first part of the verse. That before you're the doer, you've got to be the hearer of it. We get so focused on do, 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 go, 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 do, 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 go, 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 that we lose sight of the, the reasons that we do those things. Now, I believe you're supposed to be a workman. You're supposed to be a workman. We just read, we just read in, in, our, in our studies today, uh, for by grace are you saved through faith, right? Is the gift of God. You know, we, we read that verse. Rightly, divide, you know, we, 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 we do all those things, and then we, we try to, in our, in, our, in our knowledge, rightly dividing, and then we leave verse 10 out where it says, a workman, right? And then it says that we were created unto good works. We leave that verse out. We just read verse 8 and verse 9, and then we leave verse 10. We just like we throw it out. We're like, yay, I'm saved by grace. And then what happens? Let's throw all the work away. That's where Baptists have gone wrong for so long. Oh, I'm saved. <laughs> I'm saved. I'm once saved, always saved. I don't need to do nothing. Amen. <laughs> and, and that's the bandwagon we jump on. 
And that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says He created you unto good works. The problem is, we need the grace and the saving before we do the good works, otherwise it doesn't mean a thing. And then we get the grace and the saving, and then we look at the works and say, oh, that work is a dirty word. Us Baptists, oh, work is a dirty word. Oh, you know, we're not saved by works. And then we, 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 we treat it, it is a four-letter word, but it's not a bad word. And we treat it as if it's a bad word. We treat it as if it's a heresy to do good things for the Lord. You should be a workman. You just got to make sure that that work that God puts you in is exactly, that you're doing is the work that God puts you in, not the work that you put yourself in. In our text, in Romans chapter, in Romans chapter 10, it says in verse 4 and 5, what did they do? They put themselves, their own, well, verse 3, themselves under the righteousness of God. They, put, they established their own righteousness. They're doing it of themselves. They're not doing it of, them, doing it of God. And, and, and let me tell you something. We're supposed to be doers, but you need to be hearers first, and you better make sure that your zeal is aimed in the right direction. Some of you guys were in the military. I'm going to put it in a perspective that, even, that uh, not just even a soldier, that every soldier can understand. What comes first, the order or the action? The order. The order comes first. Now, what happens to that soldier who takes action without the order? Uh-huh. Dutch said he dies. That's a, definitely a, a scenario, right? What, here's, the, here's, what, here's what's even worse than that. Your action without the order can cause someone else to die. That's even worse than your own death. The orders come first. And you know what? <laughs> Sometimes God takes a long time to give the order. And in our zeal, in our thirst and our desire, we just run and jump right into it. And he hasn't given us the order yet. I'll give you an example. Sometimes, see, God is, God is really focused on, on, break, on building the man. He's really he's 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 big on growing the man, not growing the work. Because if you grow the man and the man walks the way he's supposed to walk, the work will grow. But he's he's growing the man. It takes time. Us Bible believers, we 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 need to grow up a little bit before we jump right into the mission field. And then we get so we get so worked up about the work that we we forget the reason we're doing the work, and then we get washed up. Look, God is not interested in, in, in developing the work. He's interested in developing the man. The best, a great example in this is Jacob. Think about this for a second. God was not interested in how long it took him to, to acquire Rachel. Well, he, he worked for seven years for Rachel, right? Yeah, and then he got Leah. Was, right? That's right. He got, hey, surprise, you're married to my sister. Okay. He was not interested in how long he had to work to acquire Rachel. He said, oh, seven years, okay, that's acceptable. I'll work for seven years worth for, your, for Rachel. And then he gets Leah. And then he cries out and says, why have you done me so wrong? Uh, now I've got to work seven more years for Rachel. Do you, you think God thought half a second about how long it took him to acquire Rachel? He didn't. You know, you know what God was concerned about? God was concerned about keeping Jacob right where he was so that he can teach him some things. In that 14 years, he learned a lot under Laban. Mostly how not to get the shaft in a business deal. <laughs> Am I right? Both of them were creeps. Both of them were dishonest men. He learned. God had to develop Jacob. And it took him 14 years, and then some... Quite a bit, but it took him 14 years till he finally let he, he till he finally had Jacob ready to to leave Laban. And you know what? God had plans for Jacob and Rachel all the time. He's like, I got I got some blessings. I, I got some kids that are going to come from that girl, and I got some blessings that are come from that boy, and they're, 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 already in, they're already in motion, and it's going to take you 14 years to get to the point where you can even 
be together, and then the blessings come later and later and later. And you know what that was? God says, I got some important children that are going to come from both of those young ladies in order to establish my people. But he had to hold Jacob in a position for a while until he finally was able to do something with him. Now, it seemed like Jacob didn't really learn his lesson very well sometimes. And that's us. Sometimes it doesn't matter how many times the Lord has told me and taught me and told me and taught me and showed me. It just seems like I still get things wrong, right? Well, that's, that's this thing called life. And that's this thing called this fleshly nature. And God had something for that girl and something for that boy. And sometimes you just need to wait and grow a little bit before the Lord can use you. The best example that I can find in the Bible is Moses. Right? Moses had a pretty difficult life. I mean, it was an easy life, but it was a difficult life when you think about it. For, until he was a young man, he was raised in the household of a pharaoh. I mean, pretty, pretty great life. He had the best of everything. He had the best of this. had the best of that. The best schooling. Best military, uh, best military training. He had, the be- you know, he, had, I mean, he had people to serve him and wait on him. He had a, a quote-unquote good life. And then, once he realized some things, you know what he had to go do? He had to go out into the wilderness and be a shepherd for a long time before God was ready, ready for him to say, hey, I got, a, I got a task for you. And we see it not just with Moses. We see it, we see it, with, uh, we see it with, jo- with Jacob. I already said that. We see that with Paul. What do you mean? <laughs> Paul had some growing to do. He was zealous. Boy, Paul was zealous, was he not? He was, killing by, he was killing people who believed in Christ. He was zealous. But you know what? That zeal was misdirected. He got a hold of Paul, and then what did he do? He sent him into the wilderness to learn of some things. And he had to wait there until he was ready to be used. And then he came back, and that was the greatest... He ended up being the greatest Christian that I've ever even heard of. He brought us, he brought us most of our New Testament. But you know... That zeal was misguided at one point. And then God had to tell him to hold on a second. You just need to do a little growing before I point that zeal where I want it to go. And and the problem with this is, the problem that we have in our flesh is that when we're young, uh, we're full of zeal. When we're young, we're gung-ho. All right, nothing's going to knock me down. Nothing's going to get in my way. I'm going to bulldoze through everything. And I'm going to do the will of the Lord, right? Amen. Because I'm a man. And, and I'm a Christian. And then when we get older and we get wiser, we lose the zeal. But we have the wisdom. We need both. The young man needs the wisdom of that experienced Christian. And that, that experienced Christian needs that zeal, needs that reminder of what they used to be so they go and do those things. We need both. We need a healthy mix of both. That's why it has to be tempered with some wisdom and some experience. I had, he told Jacob, he goes, you know, I, I don't know if you ever told him this. He says, but you know, I just know the Lord up there is thinking, you know, he's going to have to just sit there for a little while because I have some things that are going to come from him and he can't accomplish those things until he has Rachel. So guess what? You wait another seven years. You know how long seven years is to the Lord? He didn't even blink. To us, it seems like an eternity. And he's just telling us to wait, to to temper that zeal. I have something for you, but I need you to be prepared, and I need you to have that relationship with me. Look, that relationship that, that Jacob had with the Lord was a good one. He just wasn't always a good guy. right? I mean, he wrestled with him. He knew who he was. He had to relate. Look, that's the only thing that I can. If if the only thing you take away from this entire this entire message today is that God was really interested in developing that man before he it was interested in developing his work. And in order to do that, you have to have a relationship with Christ. That's why it's the absolute most important thing that you can do. Because once you have that relationship right. Once you and God are finally on the same page, it's no different than a marriage, right? When you, and, when you and your husband or you and your wife are on different pages and you're reading from what seems like different books, the marriage doesn't seem functional. It's no different with God. 
when you and God are reading from different books, when you and God are on different pages, and you guys can't seem to get on the same page, you can't seem to get on the right track, you can't seem to do those things, your, your walk is dysfunctional. And then once you finally mend that relationship, once you finally bring that back to where it's supposed to be, to where, well, let's just be honest, to where you were supposed to be the whole time, right? Then and only then does that walk become functional. Then and only then does it become prosperous. Then and only then will you be in God's will for doing those things that you're supposed to be doing because we are a workman. But you have to get the relationship right in order to even know if that's what you're supposed to be doing. That's the most important thing. You need to check your zeal to make sure <clears throat> you are not just plowing through a field that you're not even supposed to be in. You need to check your zeal to make sure that you are doing what the Lord wants you to do, and you, ha and you do that by building a relationship with Him. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this blessed book. Lord, I pray that you help us to really check our zeal and help us to really understand that whether or not these, some of these things are, we're supposed to be doing. And, uh, and Lord, and, uh, if there's a relationship there and you have called us into a ministry or you have called us to do something, Lord, there's going to be a confirmation and we just, sometimes we're just uh, too dense to see it, Lord. And, uh, and I pray that if we are in that, in that will, if you're doing the zeal, if the zeal is there, Lord, I pray that you help us to temper it with wisdom and help us to temper it with discernment so that we can really see if this is what we're supposed to be doing. Lord, I pray that this message does not fall on, on, on hard hearts where they, where they say, well, so the pastor said I don't have to go do this or do that because my relationship is more important. Lord, I pray that they, they finally picked up on the message that they have to have the relationship before any of that stuff matters. And I pray that they, 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 they temper that zeal with, with your will and your guidance and your wisdom. Lord, I pray that you help us to really look at each, eat, uh, take a hard look at each and every one of ourselves and really do a self-test to really see if, that, if what we're doing is, is what we're supposed to be doing and if it pleases and honors you because that is what's most important. Dutch, go ahead. 306, 306. Lord, to 